Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome you to our first service this morning. Our order of service printed for you is always in your service folder. The usual things are in there, the message notes and the connect card. Also, just a quick reminder that the new quarters meditations have been out and are available. Uh, a number of copies have already been picked up. They kick in on the 29th, so there's no huge rush. But if you haven't grabbed a copy and you'd like to grab a copy or two, they're in the basket in the usual spot. Feel, feel free to grab one on your way out this morning. Our opening hymn is going to be hymn 370. As always, thank you so much for taking the time to be here today. And may God bless our time in his word. Please stand. We continue in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, today we remember how Jesus came to his disciples and took away their fears with his word of peace. May he also come to us through word and sacrament, banishing our fears with the comforting assurance of his abiding presence. We ask this in the name of the risen and ascended Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, 
Our Heavenly Father has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We live now in his peace and rise each new day to serve him. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated. We'll continue with our next hymn, hymn 283. This week we use a Koine arrangement of that hymn. So as always with that, feel free to follow along on the screen in your service folder or in your hymnal. Our first scripture lesson for this week comes to us from John's Revelation, Revelation chapter 5, verses 11 to 14. The Apostle writes, 
Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. This is the word of the Lord. Our second lesson for this week comes to us from the Gospel of St. John, John chapter 21, beginning at verse 1. After Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee, it happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out, got into a boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And they did. They were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not, not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took bread and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. This is the gospel of our Lord. Having heard the word which brings faith, we now join in confessing that faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. It's printed for you on page 6 in your service folder. Please stand. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. 
We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. We'll continue now with our next hymn, hymn 379, Amazing Grace, hymn 379. Grace, peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. 77%. 77%, according to a recent survey, said that of the five senses, sight would be the one they would most hate to lose completely. Now, for a lot of us, the reality is, you know, glasses, right? But we live in a, a day and an age where, at least with glasses, for the vast majority of us, vision can be corrected. And, and in my case, since probably about fourth or fifth grade, only because I know enough of you well enough can I look out and actually, in the fuzziness, still recognize who most of you are. If you were to put an eye chart in front of me, without my glasses, I could maybe pick out the E. But it would be fuzzy. With glasses, though, in a recent visit with my optometrist, he, he made the observation that you're used to seeing really sharply, aren't you? And I'm like, well, yeah, I suppose. He's like, yeah, because every time we tune you in, it's just like every tiny little bit. but. You seem determined to get 2010 vision with glasses every time you're here. Vision is such an important thing that we take so often for granted. It, it just think about closing your eyes for just a minute or two and then going about doing everything you would normally do without your eyes. 
There are so many challenges that people who have lost their vision face that we sighted people do not have. Just being able to navigate even without my glasses, I could still navigate very comfortably. But no vision at all? Long before this week, I'd actually thought about this more than once in my life. And for me personally, I very easily fall into that 77%. The idea of losing my eyesight totally is a really scary thought. And I don't think this is something unique to just our American world or our modern world. I have a sense, pardon the pun, that if you were to figure out a way to conduct a poll in the ancient world or globally at most times in history you would find a similar result eyesight is so very very important which is why i think scripture so often uses sight and blindness as illustrations it's also why i think and this is purely sanctified speculation on my part, but it's also why I think the Lord chose to make Saul, at least for a few days, blind. Our text for today comes to us from Acts chapter 9. We're, we're not going to read the first nine verses, but if you were to go back and read those first nine verses, you see this is uh, not long after the stoning of Stephen. This is Saul, Saul is just, he's arch opponent number one of the Christian church. Breathing out murderous threats, Luke writes, against believers. And, and, and he gets permission to, to go up to Damascus from the, the ruling authorities in Jerusalem with official letterhead saying that if he finds any Christians, he has all the authority in the world, picture like almost a deputy out west, he has all the authority in the world to go arrest them, bring them in, and throw them at the very least in jail. And that's what he's on the way to do. Until he's intercepted by Christ himself. Christ himself appears in glory, in power, bright shining Jesus. Maybe not terribly dissimilar from the Jesus John would see later in his vision in Revelation. He appears, Saul literally gets knocked off his horse, and he has a short conversation where Jesus confronts him and says, why are you persecuting me? And Saul says, Lord, who are you? And Jesus names himself. I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting me. And then when everything fades and the light goes away, it's not just normal daylight that returns. It's, in Saul's case, that, in that moment, absolutely nothing. Nothing. No, 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 no fuzziness. No blurry vision, just simple darkness. And imagine, it, we talk about in terms of driving zero to 60, imagine going from 60 to zero on your vision. And he is, by necessity, led by the hand the rest of the way into Damascus. And he spends the next days fasting and praying. And the Lord appears to another believer in, in, in Damascus named Ananias. And that's where we pick up. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called him in a vision. Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him and restore his sight. Lord, 
Ananias answered. I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done your, to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with, the authority, with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on his name. Ananias is in no hurry. He's in fact actively trying to avoid going and seeing Saul. Blindness. Physical blindness can be an incredible hardship. But there are lots of different ways to be blind. There are lots of different ways to be blind, and already with Ananias, we're seeing a little bit of at least one way. Ananias' preconceived notions, his biases, which from a human perspective, I suppose, are really understandable. Every report he has heard about this man is bad. Really, really bad. But it's the Lord talking to him. Ananias' is bias, Ananias' is notions, his, his, his preconceptions of, of, of Saul are such that he's having a hard time seeing that the Lord may have something for Saul to do through Ananias. Something good. Blindness, as I said, isn't just a physical problem. We will often talk about having a blind spot, and not just physical, right? Most of us have them to varying degrees in different ways. You may even know a little bit what yours is. What is your blind spot? What is the thing that you have a hard time seeing sometimes? Uh, just as a, a, a general observation, uh, some people are wired to be very detail-oriented and, and, and they see the individual leaves and branches on the leaves very clearly in life. They can go around and, and, and typically very detailed people are also very organized people. But sometimes, this isn't always true, but sometimes, enough of the time that you can see patterns, very detailed people can sometimes struggle to see the big picture or reverse it. Some people have a brain that allows them to see big picture, wide view, almost naturally. They can, they can see the horizon four years out, 10 years out, 50 years out, and it just comes naturally to them. Well, often, enough that again you can see trends, those vision people struggle with detail and detail work and, and being organized. We all have our blind spots, and, and that's just in terms of, 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 of basic wiring. There are other areas where we can have blind spots too. And what Jesus is talking about here in Matthew 23 is a big way in which we human beings are so often blind. And remember, he's talking here, by the way, Matthew 23, quick context, he's talking to church people. And not just church people, he's talking to people who you would normally picture being or teaching Bible class. These are the people who are supposed to know something. And how does Jesus start? He says, whoa. Not like, whoa up. Whoa as in bad. Woe to you blind guides. You say, if anyone swears by the temple, it means nothing, but anyone who swears by the gold of the temple is bound by that oath. You blind fools. Which is greater, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? 
And anyone who swears by the temple swears by it and the one who dwells in it. And Jesus is just sometimes pointing out the foolishness of the rules we human beings come up with. We can get so focused on rules and order that sometimes the rules that are come up with just don't make sense. But this is fairly mild in comparison to what Jesus brings up next. Verses 23 to 26. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You have practiced the latter without, without neglecting the former. Blind guides. You strain out a gnat but swallow a camel. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they're full of greed and self-indulged. Blind Pharisee. First clean the inside of the cup and dish, and the outside will also be clean. <clears throat> Spiritual blindness can be a terrible affliction even if your physical eyesight is 20-20. It keeps you from seeing. It keeps you from seeing what Jesus is talking about here. You have these teachers of the law, these Pharisees, who are very fastidious, very, very intentional about making sure they're getting their offering in. Can't forget that. Again, in the modern world, it would be, you know, they would be the person that would have the check on the table Saturday night. They would be the person that would set up their automated giving to be ready to go every month without fail. But these people, Jesus says, for all of their outward giving, have forgotten even bigger things. They're not caring like they should about justice or mercy or faithfulness. It's all outward performance for them. Even as they do their best to ignore that lame cripple near the temple steps as they walk in or as they maybe aren't quite so caring about making sure judgments are fair, especially when it involves their rich friends. Or, verse 24, you blind guide, you strain out a gnat but swallow a camel. That is a really interesting turn of phrase. Boy, can you see it, sadly, too often in the church. We argue as, a, as, as churches, we argue about little detail things that really anybody who's not a Christian or maybe even just not a member of that particular church, looking in from the outside, they would go, boy, is that that big a deal? Really? People will, voters meetings and, 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 and bylaws and everything for little detailed things, straining out that nap. Well, swallowing a camel, being willing to turn a blind eye to big, big things either within the church that aren't good or ignoring big, big things in the community. And then there's verse 25 and 26 too, right? It's again, outward appearance, the hypocrisy of it all, right? Making sure everything looks good on the outside but the inside is a mess. And, and really... It's not just the fact that the inside is a mess. It's the fact that the Pharisees, so, so caring and so, so concerned about what everything looks like in appearance, and, 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 and yet they have no desire to really change, to really change their heart on the inside. Spiritual blindness can be a terrible thing. In the end, really, the eyes are useless physically if the mind is blind. 
It, it, sometimes we'll joke, right, about you not being able to see your hand in front of your face. Or sometimes my wife will very correctly point out the fact that it's right there. It's right there. It hasn't moved. It's been there the whole time. And no, it's not because my glasses were off my face. It's because I just didn't see it, whatever it was. Whether you're talking relationships, whether you're talking vision in the outside, toward the outside world, whatever. When the mind is blind, when you have significant major blind spots, it can be just as debilitating as losing this. Which is why it's such a blessing that Jesus is who he is. One more verse here from 2 Corinthians. The irony of this all, right, is that it's Saul slash Paul who writes these words. Mr. of Tarsus, who was blinded on the road to Damascus, who was very spiritually blind well before the Lord briefly took away his physical sight. Years later, Paul very correctly writes, The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Spiritual blindness can often blind human beings to who Jesus is. Which is often the root cause of simple unbelief. But again, it's good for us to ask too. Uh, not just what are the gods of the age that are blind to the unbelievers. What may be God of this age or God of my life is blinding me. Which again is why it's so important that Jesus is who he is. Because Christ has power. Not just to take Saul and make him sighted again, but he has power to take the spiritually blind and help them to see too. And by the grace of God, he's done that for you. Christ has dispersed the darkness so that you are able to see. Back to Saul slash Paul one more time. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. Paul's physical sight was returned to him. But even more importantly, even more important than Saul being able to see the cup of water in front of him, Paul was now able to see Jesus Christ as the living water that he is. He was able to see Jesus. Really see Jesus. The Savior, the Messiah, the Christ, the Redeemer. The one who saves even men like Saul. Blindness again, dispersed. In Saul's case, physically dispersed, but also spiritually by the light of the sun. Darkness driven away by Christ. Once blind, as we sing in the hymn, but
but now Saul sees. Once blind, you and I were too. But now we see. We see Jesus for who he is. For God who said, two verses after that one section we read, read right? The God who leads to his blinded people. Well, Paul continues. For God who said, the light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God displayed in the face of Christ. The creator God, the creator God who said, by she or, it's the Hebrew, Genesis 1, let there be light. That God, in power, and in grace, is shining his light into your heart. And now you can see the face of Christ. Now you know who he is. You have the knowledge to know who Jesus is and what he has done. What he has done for you. Jesus points to himself as that light. Quoting the prophet Isaiah in Luke chapter 4 as he's preaching early in his ministry in Nazareth. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the captives and recovery of sight for the blind. And yeah, Jesus would go around healing people's physical blindness at times. But he would end up healing a whole lot more people's spiritual blindness. Psalm 19, 105, a classic of the Old Testament. Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. The Bible helps us see as a very practical matter. The Bible helps us see the good way to go. It helps us to see the better way. It helps us to see the idols and the gods of this age for what they are. It helps us to see through the half-truths. It helps us to see perhaps, for example, that in the end, our political leaders or political ideology or political party are not our savior. That's Jesus. Jesus is the redeemer. He's going to be the one who saves. Don't put the crown on savior on the new hot thing running for election or re-election this fall. Leave the crown on Christ's hand. The Bible shows us a better way. But again, more importantly, it shows us first and foremost Jesus. The gospel, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, the righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. It's absolutely wonderful, beautiful words. Who here has ever felt the pressure of performance? It's our whole world, right? Our whole world is about achieving, getting things done, performing, doing a good job, getting the A, getting the scholarship, getting the promotion. Everything is rated.
This gospel promise he has given you, the gospel promise he has repeated now for thousands of years, that gospel promise is never going to go away. That salvation in Christ isn't going to run out. Your heavenly home will be there. <clears throat> you can be certain of it. One day you will see, not just with the eyes of faith, but with these, you will see the face of God. Let's pray. Please. Lord Jesus, you are the light of the world. The light of darkness can overcome. You overcame the darkness of sin and death. You've overcome the darkness of unbelief in us. We ask that your light would continue to shine in us, strengthening us, encouraging us, freeing us, that we may walk in your light and in your peace. Be with us today. Help us to rejoice in your love today. But then also help us to rejoice in your love tomorrow. Help us to find peace of your, in your light on Tuesday. Help us to see an opportunity to share light with somebody else on Wednesday. And then, next Sunday, help us to find peace in your love and light again. We ask these things as we ask everything, always in your name. Joining in the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and power, and the glory. You know, on page eight, with the preface, page eight. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. And we lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is good and right so to do. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father. Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, the true Passover Lamb, who has taken away the sin of the world and by his resurrection restored everlasting life. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name. Join the glorious. Lord Jesus Christ. On the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it. 
in remembrance of him. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Please be seated. The Lord's table has been prepared. Come forward in the peace and joy of the Lord. We continue now with the closing prayer and blessing. Please stand. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you've refreshed us with this Holy Supper. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now, may the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest upon you today and always. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give to you his peace. Amen. Please be seated. We'll conclude our service this morning with our final hymn, hymn 727, There is a Higher Throne. <laughs> everyone thank you so much for taking the time to be here announcements usual places up on the screen your service folder online two quick things I want to mention um, that, that are for this morning and then also for the coming weeks um, first of all for this morning between services this morning place of the normal Bible classes has been announced online um, we'll be having a presentation from one of our members Rebecca White who spent a number of weeks overseas in Ukraine helping out with medical care over the last, last number of weeks, and she's going to take some time today to, to talk about that and her story and, and everything related to that. And we thank her for taking the time to do that. Um, also, um, over the next number of weeks, we, we got an email. We don't know the exact timing yet, but over the next number of weeks, it looks like um, our delivery date for the chairs for the new seating is probably going to be moved up. It sounds like that they're going to get done with stuff sooner than they thought which means that instead of middle of June or so, we're probably looking at um, the latter part of this month-ish, which means if you're at all interested in taking one of our venerable seating options here, um, if you would like one, if you know somebody who would like one, please let us know sooner than later so that we can get that set aside for you so that we can, when the new seating gets here, we can make space. 
If you have any questions about that or anything else, as always, feel free to catch me after church. Be well, be safe, and Lord willing, we'll see you again really soon.